Hey everybody, how's it going? Dan Schinder here on Drum Talk TV, coming to you from Globe, Arizona. Where the f is that? I live here and I don't even know. Well, actually, we're 100 miles east of Phoenix, up in the mountains, and I'm thrilled to have once again one of my favorite drummers, Eric Imprada, who's in Culver City, my parents' old stomping grounds. How are you? I'm good, Dan. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for taking time to join us. Get caught up. It's been since uh, the 2020 NAM show, I believe, since we saw each other. That seems like forever ago. I know. It's, it's such a trip because I feel like when that happened, it's the first time I'd ever heard of COVID. So yeah. I remember leaving the NAM show being like, I wonder how many musicians <laughs> just got this thing. Yeah. And I never would have thought that it, it would be, what, two years, can be three years before the next one. Is the next one in June? Yes. Yeah. Okay. June 3rd through 5th. Yeah. And um, my son, Alex, who was our photographer at that show, he and another gentleman working with us got really sick af right afterwards. And I, unlike most people, I've never gone home sick from the NAM show, but I went home and at first I thought it was exhaustion because it's rough for us. It's 14, 18 hour days and it's just, it's a week and, it, uh, but I was in bed for two weeks. And then my son said, do you think we had COVID after like months later? And I said, I don't know now that you mention it, but then I got it that following November for like a month and a half. And my wife, Enja had it for like two and a half months. It was pretty rough. So folks stay safe. I don't want to get into all the details of that, but just stay safe. So let's talk music. Eric is in two awesome bands, Fever 333 and Night Versus, two completely different bands. We'll get to that. We're also going to show some clips of some, some of my favorite videos by Eric. I think we've probably featured about 25 videos from you over the last, how long has it been? Like five years, maybe six, something like that, right? Yeah. Uh, to be honest, I'm, I'm always so grateful because you guys were the first drum blog to ever feature any of my stuff. So I always just keep sending it because I, I appreciate it. And you guys have been supporting Thanks. me since since the beginning of my career. Thank you. I've got your back, your front, your diagonal, your sides, <laughs> behind the ears, everything. And so if you don't mind me asking, how old are you now? I'm 32. And you were like 12 when we first, no. <laughs> yeah, you were, I think, 26. So it's been like six years. Yeah. 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 Very cool. So if you're not familiar with Eric's playing, a few things you, I don't know, one is that um, he's got a great series. I'll show a clip from it in a moment. Uh, drumming ADD, which is just the concept of it, is hilarious in itself. And it's just stuff that's all over the place. And someone might watch that who's really into groove and pocket and go, yeah, but where's the groove? Because it's just crazy chops all over the place. But then you watch him lay down a real greasy, thick-ass, fat, sweaty groove with a bass player. And you might say, yeah, but where are the chops? He's not only got all that, but he can do a backflip from one <laughs> drum thrown backwards to the other. Because you grew up basically in a circus on the trapeze, right? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, no, I I um I competed in gymnastics when I was a kid, but by the time I got to like fifth grade, it was five hours a day, and I just wanted to skateboard and play music. So then I think continuing on and, and skateboarding, and I did diving in high school and all sort of stuff, just kind of kept my kinesthetic sense sort of together. Yeah, and I don't know, I just whatever I can do to express myself, whether it's physically or or visually with the art or whatever i just if i can put it into my playing i do so i think that's kind of where the jumping and the backflipping and all that stuff came from because ever since i started playing drums that just came with it i i don't i never i don't know anything else to be honest i can sit if i'm supposed to but like in general it just happens even when i'm alone that's awesome and eric does have an awesome uh design line of drum heads through Remo that we're going to show a few of in a moment, including a new one that's coming out next month in May. And uh, if you see me look over here, folks, I promise I'm not watching the Flintstones. I'm actually pulling up the show so I can see your comments. So let us know if you have any questions for Eric. Give us a shout out. Let us know where you're watching from. And let's just dive into some of the music I'm going to show two things first. I'm going to go from an example of drumming ADD. This is number nine. 
Number nine. Oh, okay. Number nine. <laughs> Um, and then we're going to go to you playing with uh, Cameron McClellan from Tool, right? Well, Cam Cam's from Protest the Hero. Oh, and yeah. then Justin's from, That's from Tool. Right. Which Justin's one is from it? Tool. I didn't have that video queued up, but the one with Cameron is awesome. That was one of my first, yeah. uh, vid my second video that I saw of you uh, doing just the bass and drums things. So you won't see it, Eric, but they will, but you'll probably hear it. Here we go. Check this out, folks. First, ADD drumming number nine. Check this out. I just love this. Just love it. It's great. But let's show something completely different. Check this out. Eric with Cameron McLennan. Check this out. <laughs> So the reason the reason I wanted to show those two first folks and Eric is because it's just a great example of being a very well-rounded musician. You know, those are two things just completely different from each other. And I've seen you do many other things. Let's talk about some of your first influences and how'd that trajectory go? Have you pretty much stayed with the same type of influences or are you always finding new things to affect your musical sensibilities and then apply that to your drumming? Um, I, I feel like I evolve in some way, but there's this part of me that I don't ever want to change. And I, I like to have a little bit of ignorance with music. I, I feel like the more that you play drums, the more that you hear the same patterns and, and there's a certain part of it that doesn't have the same magic. So uh, with, with a lot of drummers that I follow, I don't analyze what they do because I don't want to know. If I hear a fill that that is really interesting to me, I want to remember how it feels and then make something that feels like that. But I don't want to learn their chops or anything like that. It's just not, right. it's not interesting to me. So from the beginning to answer your question the the first drummers i heard were like i guess ringo because my dad is like a huge beatles fan and then i when i was i don't know why i remember this but when i was four years old i had a person watching me and my sister and they put on mtv and green day played and that was like the first band i loved oh, wow. so it started with that and then once i heard john theodore with mars volta it's like a junior in high school no, sorry, sorry, uh, in junior high. Uh, that kind of was it for me. When I heard his playing, um, I mean, his favorite drummer was John Bonham, but it was like John Bonham on on drugs. It was just so fast <laughs> and intense. And it was this really cool balance of, you know, off-kilter rhythms and, and, and interesting timings, but you could still digest it even if you weren't a drummer. And I think that's where a lot of times my cutoff is, is if it starts to get so technical that a non-musician can't enjoy it, then, you know, I can appreciate it, but it's not something that I play all the time. Um, now, back, I, I, back up one step. I'm sorry. For those not familiar with him, say his name again so they can look him up. Oh, John Theodore. He played on the first three Mars Volta records, and then now he's in Queens of the Stone Age. And yeah. for a brief minute in between there, he played with Zach, the singer of Rage Against the Machine, in a project called One Day's a Line. And I understand he's going to be on our show in either April or May. So I will let you know. Oh, amazing. Yeah, really cool. I'm excited about that. We've got some other uh, great interviews coming up. I'll mention those at the end of the show. Right now, it's all about Eric. Uh, but go <laughs> on. Tell tell us more about the trajectory of your influences. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I just I, I had a hard time practicing as a kid because it was hard to focus. And then 
when I started jamming with my friends uh, around junior high, like seventh grade, uh, that's when I cared. So everything before that, it was it was fun to to jump on the kit and play for thirty seconds and then just go skateboard to do whatever. But <laughs> once I had friends that wanted to play guitar and bass, it was like everything made sense because all I ever wanted to do was play in a band. I never wanted to be a solo drummer. I never wanted to do drum competitions or any of the stuff that I ended up getting into. And I remember we were trying to record something when I was in like seventh grade and we were trying so hard. It was like our hundredth take or whatever it was on my like boom box. And my cousin came in, my older cousin and like messed up the recording to be funny. And I took it so serious <laughs> that I think everybody was like shocked. Like who cares? And I was like, I don't know. I remember at that point being like, why am I so into this? And everybody else just kind of doesn't care. I think you were already married to your craft or something, right? Possibly. I mean, I just, the minute that I got to play with guitar and bass, I was like, yeah, this is, this is why I got a drum set. So from then, um, I, I, when I went into high school, I started playing with Nick and Riley and those are the two, uh, the bass player and the guitarist in Night Versus. So I'm 32 and we've been playing together since we were 12. So That's I feel very, awesome. very fortunate for that. And I'm sure as anybody that has played with someone a long time knows, it's like you can't really replace that chemistry. So we try and hold on to that as much as we can. And with them, um, after high school, we got signed and we toured the world. And at that same time is when I entered the drum off. Um, yeah. So. They don't do it anymore, but for a long time, the Guitar Center drum off was this big nationwide competition. That was where 2013, right? The The year that I got to the finals was 20. Yeah, 2013. Yeah, I think so. Tw well, it was, but it was like the December. So it was like 2012, but yeah, it ended up airing 2013. So that that was my fifth year doing it because I was in I had just left high school, got into college at the time. And then when I got to the finals, I only did that just to see if I could get better at drumming. Like I didn't ever expect to get to the finals. I didn't expect that video to do what it did view wise. But I remember the first time I went, I'd never heard gospel drumming before. And that's what most of my competitors were doing. And it was like a foreign language to me. Like I, I was like, okay, I've, I've been playing drums for like five, six years at the time. And I've never heard anything like this. So it was kind of jaw dropping, but I would always get to like every year I'd progress. So I, I kind of felt like, okay, well, even if this is amazing and I don't understand it, I'm obviously offering something here that, that is, is getting me further and further along. And right. when I got to the finals, I think at that point is when um, I got to meet a lot of my drum heroes. So like Thomas Lang was there and uh, John Blackwell was there and in the semifinals, Virgil Donati judged and, all these people had said uh, really encouraging things to me along the way. And I think, you know, at that time I was like in those competitions, I was doing headstands and a lot of double bass and, and I, I yelled and these are all things that I did when I was a kid and I still do, but having those people, you know, recognize it and feel like it, it belonged there was kind of, I think a big confirmation for me. So I did that and that video did much better than I ever would have thought. I think it's at like 20 million oh, views. Oh, yeah, on our channel, it went viral. Uh, and I don't remember the highest number. I want to say maybe 14 million, <laughs> something like that. Yeah, on our Which Facebook is, page alone. It's so funny to hear that because I was so like, I didn't know what I was doing. I played everything above my head. I just was like, how... Like, if I'm going to do this, if I'm going to be up next to some of the best unsigned drummers in the world, like, I got to do everything I can. And it, it's funny because you have no control with what people connect with. You just make what you make and, and you put it out there. And that, I, I would say, in, in a way, that competition and that video changed my life because, like I said, I never pursued anything as a solo drummer. I always wanted to play in bands. And then when I saw people connect with that, I was like, all right, I guess in this spectrum of drumming i have something to offer so since then i've done a lot of solo work and work that focuses on drums as the the centerpiece um alongside the bands that i play in just right. because i felt like i don't know i found my place in getting to offer something that i didn't see a lot of other people doing that's um, awesome that's great so yeah and then from there i, I toured full-time for the last 
well, I started in 2012 touring full time and I'm, I'm still doing it. And I've done, I got to do the bag show in Paris with Thomas Lang and Dennis Chambers. And I got to play Minel Drum Fest with Benny Greb and Chris Coleman. And that whole side of my career, I literally never had any intention of being part of, but I'm very thankful and it's it's improved my drumming a lot and helped me bring a lot to the bands that I play in. That's awesome. Let's show some more video. This is the one I was remembering <laughs> Justin from. <laughs> Check this out. The, and I have to preface this, everybody. You need to like literally grip onto something because Eric's playing in a, a red house of mirrors and this could create inertia like you think the room's moving. Dig this. This is awesome. be too cool actually that video but we showed it anyways that did you ever look at the wrong justin like oh that's a reflection wait oh no he's left-handed there too like what was that like it was crazy i um i grew up a huge tool fan me and my guitarist uh nick love tool and fever had been on tour in the summer and happened to play some shows with them because they had come back for their new record and we met each other backstage and he's super cool. And we kept in touch during quarantine. And so at the beginning of quarantine, I made this mirror room just because I wanted to do something in it. I didn't know what, but I had been watching uh, this film Beyond the Black Rainbow and they had this amazing mirror room scene. And I was like, all right, I got to do a drum solo or something. I made it. And then I reached out to Justin and I was like, hey, do you want to play in this? And, do and he's a, like do on this well. giant Lazy Susan. Yeah, he made that. That was the coolest thing. So, <laughs> so I, I asked him and he goes... Literally, his response was, uh, have you seen Enter the Dragon from Bruce Lee? And I was like, no, nah, I haven't seen it. And he goes, well, I will do the video if you watch Enter the Dragon. So I was like, okay, for sure. So I watched the scene, saw what he was talking about. And then he showed up in Orange County and literally, like, we had sent each other's ideas back and forth. And then he showed up, learned everything and jammed it out. And he's so cool that I didn't think about it when he was playing. But when I would be behind the camera and like directing him in some of his parts as he was going, I think that's when it would hit me like, damn, this is this is the bass player that I, I grew up listening to and jamming along with. So it was a it was a trip because it was not something I ever expected to do. And he was so cool throughout the whole process. That's awesome. I'm going to read some shout, give some shout outs, read some comments and questions. Okay. Um, let's see. We've got where's my mouse? Here we go. All right. Jim Ho. Chiming in, Gregor Hudson. Hello, how you guys doing? Alexander Kahlo. Um, Michael Leslie says, could Eric explain where the influence came for the piece? Oh, with Justin Chancellor. Was it a total collaboration with the improv or was the idea there earlier? Before you answer, I want to mention yeah. that that jam reminds me of um, the return to forever song from romantic warrior that's um the the part of the jester and the what song is that where the bass goes boom like part of it has little reflections of that it's really cool i i can't people help me out what song is that the jester and the but anyways go ahead and answer his question i i've always wanted to tell you that and i keep forgetting no, that's that's really cool to hear. Um, I had recorded a solo in the room and I, I had written a solo, recorded it in the room and I didn't know what to do with it. And I, I hit up Justin and I was like, hey, are you down to write over this? And he was like, yeah. So 
he took my already written solo and came up with like six different takes over it. And then we kind of went through and thought what sound would sound best. And then he learned that version of it and then we had recorded it. So it started with drums, but shout out to Justin for being willing to learn all those different parts and, and kill it. It was it was really cool to see his interpretation because I, I never would have thought of that stuff. That's awesome. I, I'd love to see and hear the ones you didn't use. Uh, <laughs> I've got them somewhere on a hard drive. I It's funny because I spend so much time on these projects and then once they're done, yeah. I just... I just let them go because I've got so many other things I want to do, but I could probably find them at some point. I get that. Um, Angelina, Christina, hello. Salaberry Roberto, awesome drummer in Brazil. Uh, per Ronstadt, I hope I'm pronouncing that correct. Hello from Sweden, Eric and Prada and Dan. Michelle. Uh, I'm sorry, Michael Leslie also says right on such an influence on the drums and art fellow drummer love uh, loved you guys in Sacramento and he's writing in from Libsyn. And so Stephen, our associate producer, um, put in a link to your heads. Let's talk about the drum heads first. Talk about how this started, then I'm going to show them and name them one at a time and maybe you tell a little story about each one. And uh, I, I just love this because my mom was an artist. I've dabbled in art. My wife, you know, Angie is a professional artist as well. And these are just awesome. Go ahead and talk about where that began. And then I'll show a few. Thanks, Dan. Um, sure. I uh, So when I was in college, all I wanted to do was tour. And we just didn't have any tours at the time. So I worked at the YMCA to make money for seven years. And I had a boss in the downtime that gave me a sketchbook and was like, you should draw. So anytime the kids are doing homework, uh, I just drew like two, three hours a day. So I didn't start really drawing seriously till I was like 18. And my dad is an artist for Disney, but oh. it, so I, I knew I'd been around art, but his style is, is very, very different from mine. And so I think I knew, like I knew what the standard of, of great drawing would be, but I just never pursued it until I had that downtime. And I had done it and I did it on tour because a lot of times we, especially early on, we didn't have smartphones or anything else. So it was like, it was what you, I could do for fun uh, backstage or whatever. And I remember I was doing that video, uh, the drum chain that you guys had featured where I had all the different drummers. And for some reason, I really, really wanted to have the art on my drum heads for that. Like I just, for whatever reason, I, I really wanted it to happen. And there was a great company called Visionary Drums from I think Portland. And I'd ordered it through them, but they printed it at Remo. And it wasn't going to get there in time, but Remo was down the street from me. So I was like, oh, well, if it's done, I can go pick it up. And so this was definitely like a sort of serendipitous right place, right time thing, because I'd gone to Remo to pick up the heads and ran into my rep at the time, Adam Murphy, who now works with me at Schechter. And Adam and me caught up real quick as I was walking in the door and I grabbed the heads and he goes, so what have you been up to? And I was like, oh, I'm working on this video. What are you up to? And he goes, well, we're looking for an artist to do a series where they illustrate on the heads. And I was like, <laughs> well, I, I Did just... he get that idea from seeing your heads, not knowing it was you? No, he, so they had done one before with Jose Pasillas from Incubus, uh, who's somebody I also grew up, love. I love those records. So I, yeah. I listened to Jose a bunch and they did one head with him like a year and a half before and they were looking for another artist. And as he asked, he didn't know I printed these. So I was like, well, I have these in my hand. And I go, what about these? And he goes, these are great. So we did um, three different Tom designs. Three? Yeah. We did a 10 inch, uh, 12 inch, uh, 14 inch. Oh, so four Tom designs and a 16 inch. And then we did a snare design, which looks really cool, but it's on a smooth white head. And for me and the way that I play, it wasn't durable enough. So even though it looks beautiful, the way that they had printed it, um, we're releasing a new one on an Emperor X, like a new design next month. And the most uh, interesting thing to me about the way they did it is they printed the art between the ply. Ooh. So it doesn't blur. There's nothing that's gonna distort the actual image. And it actually adds this like layer of warmth to it that I 
pr kind of prefer at this point because I've played them so much. So yeah, it's it's really cool because it's not like I just drew on it and all of a sudden when you hit it, it, it yeah. distorts or blurs. Like they did an amazing job as far as integrating the art into the actual technology of the head. Let's show them. That's such a great story. So this first one, you can tell a little story about each one. This first one is called, and it's coming up in a moment. Come on, computer. There we go. It's called New Sun. Um, I I love that. Um, and I, you know what? I got to minimize that for a second. I think I have an affinity for that and the King Crimson shirt you wore in that one because the only tattoo I have is of a sun. You know what's so funny? And I drew I, that myself, by the way, the whole thing. Really? Yeah. That's So I wore the King Crimson shirt when I was at rehearsal for my last tour. Uh, it's so funny you said that. And we were in the middle of nowhere at this big rehearsal studio and Mike, Mike Portnoy walked in because his son was playing for the opening band. And he sees me and he's like, King Crimson. And then he pulls out his arm and he has the exact same <laughs> King Crimson son tattooed on That's him. That's right. And uh, it was it was really funny and an interesting coincidence, but that that image itself was actually one that that that's the only one that I did because they were asking to film it on the spot. So the other ones I had drawn on tour, that one they said, "Hey, let's do an image where we get to film the whole thing." So they came over to my house uh, in Fullerton, where I'd grown up, and Remo had literally set up a camera and was like, "Go!" Wow. So that that one was completely on the spot for Remo. And then the other ones I would do kind of when I was traveling on tour. So let's, that's awesome story. Let's look at the next one. This is called Nocturnal Bloom. And I love the dimension that this has. And these are sort of, or are they man, mandalas basically? I mean, they are. I, I feel like that it's become such an open interpretation as far as like what constitutes a mandala. But that's for true. me, I, I was learning how to draw them. Um, like my first year of touring and this was probably done my fifth. And I remember doing it on the night before Halloween. I think it's called Devil's Night, but we had we had driven through the night. It was like 5 a.m. and we had just ended our drive and I couldn't sleep. And I remember the, this, God, we were, we were somewhere on the East Coast and it was like the most massive orange moon and I couldn't sleep. So I just ended up drawing with that outside my window and then the name felt appropriate from that. So that was, that was a while ago, um, but I had awesome. done that before that the actual Remo collaboration happened and I already had it. Awesome. Let's take another look at that before we go to the next one. And I have a question. Are you using repeatograph pens for that? Because I it looks like it with the dots that you've done with the shading, that's kind of a technique I learned from watching Roger Dean's uh, artwork that for the Yes covers back in the day. I don't, what do you mean repeatograph? Sorry, I don't know what that that's is. That's okay, repeatograph is a pen that has basically a liquid ink cartridge in it. And then the, the where the ink comes out looks like a hypodermic needle that comes in different thicknesses, basically. Oh, interesting. No, yeah. I honestly, I just used Pilot, like oh. G2.05. You can get oh, them wow, at, nice. at like Target. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that's cool. I, they never bleed and they make the perfect sizes. So I, just, I still use those to this day when I can. Cool. Look up Repeatograph. I think you would love those. I'll check it out. Um, and these are all done freehand, correct? Yeah. For the most part, you can tell every once in a while, like I'll use a stencil for some of the center points. Um, but I would say like the center circle, but 90%, if not more, is usually freehand. Awesome. Cool. I just zoomed in on, on that one. Now this next one, if I can get it to click over, is going to be... Bear with us, folks. Someone that knows what they're doing will be right with you. You know, we'll do it like this. This is Sleep Lotus. That's beautiful. Thanks. My um, my now fiance, but Ooh, girlfriend at the congratulations. time. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, she was working at a yoga studio, and she would have these like long nights where she'd have to clean up after the studio because um, she was an instructor for five years. So. At the time, I was trying to do something that could possibly go on the wall at the studio. And then that's where that one came from. And we ended up using it as a wall graphic for something. But uh, her, it was like super, super late at night when I drew that one. And her uh, yoga like handle was Black Lotus Yoga. So I was nice. like barely awake at the time. And it ended up looking like it was supposed to be called Sleep Lotus. <laughs> that's cool. And here's the new one that's coming out in... 
April or May? Uh, May. Technically, it's out, but there's it's all the people that have bought it to sell it just haven't received their shipments yet. Okay. So I know, I think it's steveweiss.com is going to be one of the first places that you can purchase it. And then the buy link should also be available on Remo's website at remo.com slash artbeat. And that should be um, active within, like that link should be active within a month. Okay, cool. And we have that link in the post text, uh, in the comments, folks. Um, and uh, this is this is really neat. I'm gonna zoom in on this one. Check that out, folks. Look at that. That is so cool. I like wanna call my wife in here. I gotta show her these afterwards. That is just beautiful. Looks Thanks, like man. fun. Yeah, you're welcome. I should just get these. Um, there's a couple comments here. I'm sorry, one made me laugh inside. Thomas Morrison says, "Wow, walked in and Eric and Prada is on. So badass." Uh. <laughs> so remember to send him the five bucks. Just kidding. <laughs> Angelina Christina put her uh, icon with a ton of hearts. Um, Alexander Callow again from Libsyn asks, and maybe you'll know what he's referring to. I think I know what he's referring to. He says one question. Do you use groove drum, drum with two M's? Do you know what that is? I don't know what that I'm is. I'm not sure sorry. either. Yeah, sorry, Alex, let us know what that means. Um, and uh, Michael Leslie says, that's amazing, kudos. Uh, Gregor says, Gregor Hudson says, I got into Eric when he did that epic drum solo, oh, at the Guitar Center's drum off. That was amazing, that's cool. Let, speaking of which, let's show more videos. Let's see here. Let's go with, um, <laughs> I love this one. I, I don't know if this is the actual name of it. This is what I call it. No, maybe this is. You, you tell me. I don't remember if this is your official name or my made-up name. It's called <laughs> Eric and Prada Acrobatics One Note at a Time. That's not... Is that's that my not name? my name. Okay. That's your name. <laughs> that was for me to reference what is. Folks, don't try this. No, you know what? Go ahead and try it at home. Is this the jumping one? Yeah. The one that's one? Okay, okay. Okay, here we go. to be my favorite linear ostinato of all time <laughs> <laughs> thanks dan yeah that's great let's watch some more let's watch uh uh this is the solo you did uh that's live and you're using i was going to ask you about this eric you're using i believe the same device that's to your left that you had on the floor tom in that other video where you're sliding your finger and what is that so the one, there's a chaos pad, which is, you're talking about the one where it like, it slides on the pad and it makes the different sounds. Yeah. Yeah. And that one's cool because it can modulate stuff that comes through it. Um, it's a little weird to get used to the coordination of your left hand and your right and left foot being separate from you sliding. Cause right. normally obviously you kind of keep time with that. So that like, there were a couple of coordination knots that I had to untie to be able to pull that off. But um yeah, I don't know. I love DJ Shadow and DJ Qbert and a lot of the like early 90s trip hop. So I wanted to find a way to do something that felt like scratching, I guess, yeah. in a way. Um, but then on drums and and with the limitations of me being a drummer. So that's where the influence came from. And then they they also make a K oscillator, which is the same thing, but it has its own sounds in it. So this one filters what you put through it, and then the K oscillator like has its own sounds. Yeah, it's like a yeah. synth, but you touch it with your That finger. is so cool. Check out this solo, folks. I love this. This is one of us.
you know, I got to practice. <laughs> I need to practice. I love watching that. You know, whenever we do live interviews, there's always some troll. Goodness gracious. This guy says love Eric's work. Oh, that's Dave Dicenzo. Dave, how's it going, man? <laughs> uh, Dave, Dave, you got to come back on the show as well. I'll email you or message me. Dave's yeah. the best. Dave's modern drummer drum solo is in my top three drum solos of all time. It's, yeah, it's you, unbelievable. Me too. I still, me I still too. can't that, fathom yeah. how he did it. That one, honestly, that one, yours, and Juan Carlito Mendoza. Those are oh. my three favorite that I've ever seen. Oh, that's awesome. Thank yeah. you, Dan. Sure. Very cool. And uh, there's a question here. Oh, Alex Calo says, Groove drum is a trade of one good drum made in Portugal. So I think, um, excuse the term, but translated, he means that that's a brand of a good drum brand Oh, in interesting. Cool. Um, and then uh, Michael Leslie is asking if you could please explain your practice routine. Please tell us you practice. Uh, I do. It's, it's <laughs> changed so much over the years. Well, talk um, about that then. Like what's the arc been? Man, when I was younger, I uh, when I was 18, I had played in bands, but I was starting college and I wanted to get on the road. And I told myself, all right, I have to take this more serious. And because I, I had fun when I was in high school. I played in a lot of bands. I skated a lot. I did a lot of stuff that I could have gotten hurt jumping off roofs. And we just, our friends were always active. But at a certain point, I was like, okay, I want to travel the world. I want to play music for a living. I know that. And I had read an article about Kobe Bryant um, growing up in LA, huge Lakers fan. And Me too. it was the first... Oh, really? Yeah, oh, yeah. huge. Since the Will Chamberlain days, dude. My dad raised me on grass-fed steak and the Lakers. <laughs> That's amazing. No, but it, it's, I feel very fortunate to have grown up with that franchise. And getting to have Kobe there for 20 years was like, we were spoiled. So I remember he had an article talking about practice. And at when I was 18, it was 20, 2007. So this is the first time I'd ever heard the 10,000-hour rule. And oh. it, it, I was like, okay, well, if I practice five hours a day, that I should be able to get there. So I remember at the time practicing five hours a day, and I didn't really know what to practice. I mean, I would learn songs that seemed- I was this way. It's funny you said that just now because I was thinking to myself, five hours a day, what the fuck would I play? So well, it's that- funny you had that same, you know, you had to almost design a program for yourself then, right? For that yeah. to suit that time. Definitely. And I think um, I could have been more focused in some ways. I I worked a lot on double bass. I spent a lot of time learning like different songs that were challenging to me, but I never really liked covering stuff. So it's like I would learn the technique almost just to know I could do it. And then immediately it was like, how do I turn this into a, a Night Versus song or whatever the band was I was in at the time. So a lot of it was like I listened to music like four hours a day at the time. And I would hear these things that I wanted to do and I just learn it just to know I could do it. And then all of a sudden I would try and write something like it. So a lot of it was hearing stuff that excited me, being able to play it and then moving it directly into something that I loved because I don't know why I just never, I never wanted to play something somebody else did. Like I, I wanted to know how they did it so I could move it to my own stuff. Um, so at that time I realized pretty quickly I had to write out a schedule because just going for five hours, it's like you kind of lose track of what you're doing. And so I would do an hour of pocket and just play to a click and spread out the click super far. Um, Cause the first five years of, of playing in bands, I never played to a click. And I remember we went to a studio once and somebody gave, uh, said I had to, and I was like, oh my God, this is, this is another world. So 18 year old- I, I remember doing that for the first time and I insisted over and over that it was broken. Oh really? <laughs> no, I I I was always very open to to trying to improve myself, you know. So I remember being like, God, this is much harder than I thought. So I didn't start practicing to a click consistently till like 17. My drum teacher had me practice to a click, but when I was on my own, I just wanted to jam in a band and find my own feel. So like 17, 18 is when I started doing an hour a day with a click, hour a day of of double bass an hour a day of coming up with fills that I thought were creative, an hour a day of coming up with um, 
drum beats that I thought were creative, and then I would jam with my band for at least an hour. So I was doing that. Five hours, boom. Yeah, and and I uh, I learned very quickly that like emotionally you can get so exhausted trying something that's difficult, and you'll look at the clock and it's only been fifteen minutes. So I needed to time it because if I told myself I was going to work on you know an uncomfortable BPM for an hour. And I looked at the clock. I'm like in my head, if I'm like just dead, cause I, I'm, I can't lock in, I'm having a hard time. And it was only 20 minutes. I'm like, okay, we'll suck it up. You still have 40 left. So it helped me in that way. Uh, definitely in like a discipline aspect. And I then, was just, cause you've got to have discipline to, to wow. Just to even practice that much and for that long and have a program in place. So kudos for the discipline, man. Thanks. I, I don't know. I just, uh, I mean, I did love what I was doing, but, um, I always wanted to write. It was always about having the, the tools to be able to have more when I was writing with night versus. So I think, I don't know what it's like for people that don't have a band. I know for me, that was the biggest motivator and I never went to music school. I had a great drum teacher. Um, but I missed a lot of the foundational stuff that I, I, even to this day, I'm catching up on now when I can, because, it was always just about, I don't know, expressing myself. It was ne- yeah. like, I, I would learn the rudiments that I needed, but I, I, sh- sometimes I wish I had gone through everything. Uh, but at uh, other times I feel like it's kind of what helped me develop my own style. So I don't know, I guess I don't ever feel like there's a right way to make art. I agree. Um, yeah. There is, it's like food. It's subjective. Anything subjective. There's no right or wrong way. It's your way. It's the way you express. Totally. And, and, um, so I did that for a long time, and I remember having this moment when my friends' bands were going on tour in Europe for the first time, and I still was in college. I, I hadn't gotten invited to a tour yet, and my band wasn't signed, and I had like a like a five minute like jealousy like storm in my brain where I was just like, God, like I can play everything they're playing, blah blah blah, and then I kind of just calmed down for a second and realized you always have an advantage, and so. I, I thought about it and I'm like, this drummer is not going to have five hours a day now that he's touring full time. I'm like, so I need to take advantage of this when I'm home because when I'm gone all the time, there's, you just can't do it with travel and driving and cars and, and loading. It's just impossible. So once I started touring, all of a sudden I'm like, oh God, now that that window's gone and I'm so excited to be here, but what am I going to do to take advantage of it? So that's when I started doing those um drum around the world videos where I would drum yeah. in different locations. Oh, and I, that, that might've been the first video. Was that the first video we ever saw and posted? It might've been, cause I remember sending it to you guys and GoPro yeah. and uh, you guys both posted it, which was very exciting for me at the time. And then I was meeting people. So I was like, okay, well, because I can't take advantage of practicing five hours a day, I'll take advantage of these contacts. And so that's when I started doing the drum chain and at the time, I hadn't seen videos with 10 drummers collaborating in one song. Now, I, there's hundreds, and I'm not saying I started it, but at the time, I, I felt like I was I felt like I was doing something new. So it was fun to get to kind of venture into that world. And I'd say like that that was exciting because it was new new opportunities, but it was an adjustment not getting to practice that much, you know, because you're right. playing the same song over and over again. And so every time I got home, from tour, I'd go back to that schedule. And now, you know, I don't know. I, I, when I have the time, I practice like five hours straight and then I'll have to illustrate for two days and I have to get these illustrations done because it's what's helping me, you know, pay my bills. Not not that I don't enjoy it, but then all of a sudden I have band practice for a record for two weeks and I'm practicing five hours a day then. So it's less consistent. um, And it's definitely more focused on writing than rudiments, but When I have downtime, I still pull out like uh, books. And, and I actually was talking to Dave Vicenzo because I wanted to get his book because his Drumeo episode had such cool ideas in it. And it felt like stuff that I love the sound of, but I didn't recognize right away. So I still want to get into that stuff. And I'd love to get Dave's book. Did you know he had a ghostwriter for that? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Dave! <laughs> He's one of a kind. <laughs> Let's show, I got to show this now. Um, I'm sure I have it queued up. The kit flip. Oh, yeah. Let's show that. Try this, folks, and send in your videos.
It's so fun to watch. It really is. So how many times did you do that where it didn't work out? Or did it always work out? Because you have so much experience with gymnastics. No, it was tough um, because the, the hard part is that you have to flip up to get over the kit. Yeah. But then close because you got to land before you get, you can't pass the seat behind you. Right. So I had set up like in my backyard, like a box and like a trash can with <laughs> two trash cans, like, like the street trash cans with cable measured at the same height. Oh. My seat on the other side. And I remember the first time I tried it, I was like, this isn't going to happen. There's no, there's no way. I'm like, this is too difficult. Like I almost fell on the seat. And then I, I don't know why something just clicked in my head. And I was like, no, I have to figure this out. It's never been done. And for me, that's always the most exciting thing. Like I can't guarantee that the things that I try have never been done, but the effort to do something I haven't seen always leads to something exciting for me. So yeah. this was something I, I felt like I could guarantee it hadn't been done. Um, so I worked on it for about a month and I remember that this got shot the day before I had a massive tour. So I was kind of nervous because I'm like, if I screw this up, I'm ruining a lot of people's tour, but I practiced enough and I did it three times. Um, I landed all three, but I used the third take just cause I was happiest with the drumming. The only thing is my only regret is that normally i i didn't have to pull the seat close i could just land uh, and at the at the time the drumming was good i landed it and i'm like i cannot risk ruining this tour so i did it and it was for a gopro award and i ended up winning and it was it was good because i didn't make money for the first four years of touring so stuff like those gopro awards were, were the only thing that kept me being able to eat food and 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 survive so it was it was Definitely, definitely something I did to also be able to like survive while I left for tour for all that time. That's awesome. It's so fun to watch. Let's see if there's any more comments. I believe there are. Uh, what type of music were you listening to in those early days? Asks Thomas Morrison. Early days. I loved Mars Volta. I loved a lot of metal like Behemoth and Dimu Borgir and Emperor and then a lot of trip hop. I loved Massive Attack and Portis Head and early Hoover Phonic and Tricky. And so I think a lot of the electronic stuff came from trip hop. The faster playing came from uh, all the metal that I was growing up. Gojira and Opeth were like huge influences for me. And then the vibe of Mars Volta and their earlier band at the driving was like everything to me. Like it was the first heavy music I connected with because it wasn't tough it was like vulnerable i don't know how else to explain that it was yeah. like these wiry energetic kids that just they didn't know what to do with their energy so for me i think the full spectrum was like the mellow parts that i loved came from trip hop the heavy stuff came from from that metal world and then the the delivery i wanted to be like volta and at the driving kind of nice uh, like at dum dum i didn't cue up any um night versus or fever 333 videos but we'll feature those to promote the archive of this video talk about those two bands and how they're different and what you why you're in both of them like what do you you wouldn't get something different out of them that fills your cup if you weren't in them so kind of talk about that describe them and what elements do you really love about both bands yeah um so with night versus like i said before it was the bass player and the guitarist I've been drumming with since I was 12. And we always loved Tool and Opeth and Mars Volta and Pink Floyd. And 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 it, it's like, we always wanted to make music like that. But I, when we were young, always wanted to be jumping out of my seat and, and having high energy. And I remember they did too when we were young, but as the music got more technical, it was like, you got to pick, do you want to play these songs or do you want to just throw your guitar around? And I think naturally for us, we kept wanting to challenge ourselves. And one of the things that we always pushed with each other was that we wanted to generate all of the music between the three of us. So no tracks, anything that was going to be extra, I'd have to physically play on my pad, um, only one guitar player. And we use that as an opportunity to, to push ourselves creatively and 
I guess because we've played together so long, there's no ego. So it's amazing because anytime that we're writing, if there's a part that's good, but somebody thinks it can be better, we just make it better. We just sit there and we figure it out. And if you spend an hour trying to make that part better and you finally got it, and then in the next five seconds, someone just randomly shoots out something better than that, then that hour doesn't matter. And that's what it is. And it's very nice being with people that are just that in tune with each other. So I get to challenge myself musically in that band, but around what year was it? 2017 fever um, had formed. And what happened was basically our singer, Jason was in a band let live that used to tour with night versus all the time. And they were crazy. Like it was like at the driving where they're climbing stuff, mostly the singer, the rest of the band wasn't, but he was jumping off everything always in the crowd. And he, they took us out three different times and, and kind of gave us our first break as a band. And he saw that in me. And so when he had left that band and started a new project, he recorded two songs with Travis Barker and John Feldman. So Travis Barker, obviously a lot of drummers know he played in Bleak 182 and hundreds of other projects. And John Feldman was the singer of Goldfinger and he moved to producing in the, the later half of his career. And so they wrote two songs with Jason and they were like, this is cool. Let's get a band. And he reached out to me and the guitar player, Steven. And Steven is like the third person when it comes to climbing stuff. His band Chariot <laughs> before us was was crazier than anything. So yeah. it was it was cool because all of a sudden the music is simpler. There's tracks so you don't have to fill every gap. And everyone is is like like jumping off trusses or diving into the crowd and it made me elevate my performing because for the first time i was the most boring member to watch i mean i was like <laughs> i was trying to keep up with everybody and not in an unnatural way but like when you skate with your friends and yeah. somebody jumps off a 10 stair the next person does and then it's your turn to do it so it's it's nice because with fever i get to tour huge festivals and we get to play with a lot of my favorite bands and and it's intense and scary sometimes I've, i mean we've gotten really injured and had to play through it but it's like moments I'll never forget. And then with night versus I get all of the chemistry that I've built over 20 years and yeah. it's, it's musically a challenge. So it's, it's been fun because they both operate in such different worlds, but it kind of balances itself out for me. That's cool because as musicians, we don't have to be just one thing, you know, totally. And when I was really young, back in my day, when I was really young, um, there wasn't a lot of stuff like that people were in a band. You were either a session musician and you were everywhere, like Hal Blaine, Jim Keltner, you know, people like that. Yeah. Uh, Michael McDonald, the folks that played with Steely Dan, you know, you're either a session player and you're everywhere, or you were in a band and that was it. And I remember in 1975 when, when Yes took a break and then they all did their own solo albums. Some of them featured each other. Some of them had all these, and I thought, they're like all cheating on each other. What the heck's going on here? I was just a kid. I was like 13 or 12, whatever. And and I like I didn't know that that was a thing that you could do that. And then I got their albums and I'm like, oh, so there's this part of him and then there's this side of this one. And now it's commonplace for guys and girls to be in just like you are, multiple bands that have showed different colors and have different textures and different flavors and personalities and everything like that and it's it's wonderful it's so many different ways to express as artists you know a, a great chef totally. or baker doesn't have to just stick to one thing on a menu it's the same thing i think you know totally and and i think i think there is something beautiful about the conviction of someone being in in one project and i always respect that because i think you know you only have so much effort you can give so like when you divide those things up it, it, it's it's amazing when you can give so much to each project where you walk away and you're like, it's the best I could do. But I think for me, I had spent so much time with just Night Versus and I loved it, but this was an opportunity to do something that I just knew Night Versus wasn't going to do. And I knew, I think even starting that, that like this wasn't going to last forever in the sense that like physically, I'm not going to be able to do this forever. Uh, like, I mean, I've swung off of 30 foot trusses and, and played in crowds and, and from, I front flipped off a nine foot amp uh, in Brazil and 
all that stuff, I, I, you know, I try and look at it like, while I've got the knees to do it and, and this moment in my life, I want to take advantage of it. But, um, I can't even I, look out a 30 foot window. No, <laughs> no, but, but I, I always know night versus is going to be there for my whole life. So it was an opportunity to do something that I was like, I don't know how long this window is going to be open. And I, I, at the same time, pushed myself really hard because I had, I would literally do a night versus tour, be in the middle of the tour, go from Texas to play one show in Japan with fever and then fly the next day back to Texas to continue Jeez. the night versus tour. And I did that for the last five years. So it's been rough, but, but rewarding to get to, to do both. And a, a big element in all of that is taking care of yourself. You know, you gotta be in good as, shape. As I've learned. <laughs> yeah, for sure. What do you have coming up now that the world's opening up, you can get out and play what's going on this year with you. And will you come near Phoenix? I, I would assume Night versus Will. Um, Fever is doing, well, we just did, our, so our first tour back was opening for Slipknot. And oh, yeah. that was fun, because that was, that was like amazing to go two years of no playing and then these massive shows. Yeah. And in the, in the middle of that, I filled in for Corn last minute. They, Ray had gotten COVID, so I did three dates with- Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah it was fun. It was really, really fun. It was, wow. it was a little scary, because I had like two days to learn everything, but- um, they went well. And as I got home, Fever has been like, everybody got home to write the record. So right now, Night Versus and Fever are writing our records. And then May, I'm going to go back out to Europe with Fever to open for Corn, And then we're doing festivals from June to August. And then uh, next month, I'm going to be on the Seth Meyers show because they do the guest drummers with the HG band. Yeah. So that should be fun because it's very different from what I normally do. Yeah. And then night versus we'll, we'll have one off shows between then, but I think we're going to start doing um, like shows like more like, like uh, Arizona, Portland, Seattle, like West coast stuff okay. once I get home. And then we're also starting a Patreon. So night versus is going to be doing like nice. live jams streamed and, and, do a bunch of stuff for the people that are, are like close fans in, in between all of that. Great. Great folks. You got to get out on the road and see Eric. And let me bring these photos up again of his awesome art beat line. You can get through Remo. Steven put the link in the comments there and pinned it to the top. Check these out. That is new sun. This one is nocturnal bloom. Lots of dimension. Let's zoom in on these for you, too. Look at that. Isn't that neat? And the first one is banana. If you lick this one, it's raspberry. Just kidding. <laughs> and then we've got uh, sleep lotus. We'll zoom in on that one. Look at that. And then the new one that comes out next month. Salem. And for those who may not have tuned in when we first showed these, um, if I understand it correctly, they it's not like you could pick Salem and get it on your whole kit. It's like each design is specifically relegated to one size, correct? Yeah, but they do make a 13 inch for both the snare and the the 14 inch design for yeah. the floor tom. So you have a 13, 14 option, but in general, the designs are a specific design for 10 inch, 12 inch, 14, 16, and then the 14 inch snare. So my jazz kit is a 14 snare, 14 floor. Is I don't remember, is it a 12 inch tom? 18 inch bass drum. I don't remember what the tom is. 12 or 13, I'll check, and then I want to get these for it. I think that'd be, awesome. and it's black, too. So these would look yeah? great. Yeah, oh, that'll it. look good. Yeah. It's it's cool, too. To be, let me clarify. It was Adam's idea. Initially, we thought we'd print on white-coated heads, and Adam was like, let's try the clear. And it's so cool because on your kit, it lets the natural wood come through. So it looks really, really tasteful because you see the design, but you get to see, like, the actual wood of your drums. And, and, it, I don't and the think design's I ever, suspended. It's exactly. Like and I don't, I, I never would have thought of putting it on clear, but that was all his idea. And like, I never want to change it now. Like that we had talked about trying it on white. I did a demo of it, but the clear to me just looks so good. So my, 
my big blue kit, you know, my big giant blue kit is all different color, color tone. There's only one color that repeats itself. The bass drum and the snare are both blue. The okay. others are uh, pink, yellow, amber. Oh, pink, yellow, amber, green, purple, red, red, then purple. And then the two blues, I'd love to see these on those. I know that on some of those darker colors, it won't show up as well, but I think that would really be neat on the color tone stuff. I love those heads. Have the color tone power stroke on two snares. One's gray, one's blue, and they're totally different. One sounds like a timbali. I don't even use the snares on it. Oh, really? Yeah. You know, what you could do, because I was messing with this, is I put a color tone on the bottom head and then that on the top. And if you light it up, oh, wow. it'll light light the heads up the different colors. Ooh, I like that. Yeah, great idea. Hmm. Get them, folks. Get them. The link is in the post. And Eric, thank you so much for taking time in the evening to join us. I really appreciate it. Yeah, Dan, thank you so much, not only for for supporting me very early on, but always being being so easy to talk to and, and keeping contact with me. I I feel My like... Pleasure. There's there's like a few people that I'm so thankful for, especially for the beginning of my career when I was like trying to find out how to get a foot in the door. And I'd ask people all the time and they'd be like, oh, you'll figure it out, but never really give me substantial advice. <laughs> you'll figure and it out. No, people, I would really? put a damn and I, I'd ask people all the time and they'd be like, you know, you just got to keep playing and you'll figure it out. And I was like, what does that mean? So people like you and people like the people, uh, the judges at the drum off and a lot of the, the individuals at the beginning of my career that helped me out, I'm like forever grateful for. So thank you so much. Awesome. You're very welcome. And hang on the line before we go. And before we go, I want to mention uh, a couple of things coming up. If you're watching this live or you see this before Saturday or during the day Saturday, Saturday is my birthday and I'm doing a special show and I'm giving a bunch of Drum Talk TV stuff away. Who gives away stuff on their birthday? I do. So I'm playing one song from each of my 25 top influences. And you folks Amazing. may be surprised at what some of that is. And I'm using both my drum kits. I'm doing some stuff on the Big Giant Blue kit, doing some stuff on the four piece. I'll be going back and forth. We're doing a multi-camera shoot. It's gonna be live on the Drum Talk TV Facebook page. And if you comment on the posts that we've done about my birthday, and you'll see there's a goofy picture of me holding the big numbers 59. Ooh. I just gave that away. And if you comment on those with a suggestion, I have the list of my top 25 influences. Everyone that comments, your name will get printed on a piece of paper and every like three or four songs, I'm gonna do a drawing and you have a chance to win a Drum Talk TV shirt. I'm wearing them, one of them now. We have three dozen designs and one lucky or unlucky person, depending on how you look at it, will get to host a show with me. So tune in for that, that Saturday at, Steve put it in the comments, I think at noon Pacific, if I remember right. Um, so that's coming up, but we've also got some interviews. Tomorrow, Scott Kettner is on an awesome production uh, percussionist who's got a great book on basically frame drums playing the tambourine. We got Liberty DeVito, Bill Bruford for the first time, Cindy Blackman Santana returning, and Dominic McNabb, who is a young boy from, young man now, uh, from South Africa, who's just from another planet, okay? That's all I'm gonna say. So that's all for April, other than Scott tomorrow, and my birthday kicks off April 2nd on Saturday. And then we've got, uh, Bunch of others that we're waiting to hear back from, hopefully for May. So tune in, folks. Hang on, Eric. I want to talk to you afterwards. And everybody, thank you so much for following what we do here on Drum Talk TV. Nine years and four months in. <sighs> Thanks for putting up with me. That's all I can say. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>